Hello again, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Atlantic Bushcraft Adventures. Uh, I want to apologize for being a little light tonight. That's kind of my fault. There was some family stuff going on, and it just caused uh, me to hold up the show a little bit. But, I mean, life happens. That is, we've never been too proud to say it doesn't. Uh -huh. But in any case, tonight we're going to be chatting a little bit about fire. And uh, the pun on that one, of course, is it's a hot topic. Pun intended. But it, it, it seems to be a pretty good topic that... Uh, it always seems to come up when bushcraft comes in. Like, what's your favorite method of making fire? What what do you carry in the woods to make fire? How do you make a fire? What's the best fire lays? All these questions, which are good questions. And we can almost do a show on each individual one. But uh, hopefully tonight we'll discuss a little bit of... A little bit, and I stress a little bit, about all of those topics. And try to give uh, a little bit of a general overview. And then if you guys have something you want to hear more about, let us know. And we'll try and cover it in a little bit more depth for you. Once again, uh, speaking for myself, I'm no expert. Uh, I do have a little bit of experience with a couple different methods of fire making. And hopefully I can help you guys learn a little bit about something tonight. So if anybody's out there listening, be sure to uh, ask some questions. Because that's the only way I can really answer them for you. What about you, Ben? I know um, you got a little bit of experience fire making there as well. What's uh, To kick us off, what's your go-to method for being in the woods? Goku method? Uh, I've, I've played a fair bit with the ferro rod, and I know that seems to be the, the, the new in thing, but I still I still carry a Bic lighter, man. Uh, I, I know a lot of people frown upon it and, and, and diss it and all that, but it's instant flame. And I mean, that's you know? the thing. It's, it's easy. Anybody can, well, anybody with a little practice should be able to use a Bic lighter. So why... What's your thoughts on that? Why is it such a stigma to use a Bic lighter to light a fire in the woods? I, I know some people think it's not traditional. and I mean, lighters have been around longer than matches. Believe it or not, this is a true fact. Lighters have existed longer than matches. So it's an old method. It really is. Um, but the old ones were uh, more of a striker, more like the, uh, I think that they call it the lantern stall, like the Zippo lighters. Um, and, and I have a ton of Zippo lighters. I don't use them as much. They leak. Um, so I, I've got a few other methods I've tried. Like this is the sort of the same idea. Have you ever seen these forever matches? Yeah, I got something. I guess they're storm matches, but something close to it. But you fill them with the same lighter fluid. They got a little thing on the side and it's got a, a cotton wick. And a steel thing in there to go across the yes. different years. I I had one of those, and believe it or not, I went to strike it, and the whole side fell out of it. On uh, my, my I I bought these on Wish, or the wife bought these on Wish, and I think she paid like five bucks, and we got like twenty five of them. And uh, so I have a little baggie full of them. And other than the fact that the corners are all fairly sharp. I really do like them. Um, I don't use them as often as maybe I could, but they do work, and they have a nice little O-ring. Uh, you can sort of yep. right there at the base. And uh, that O-ring keeps the seal a lot better than Zippo lighter, actually. Um, so, and the sharp corners mean you won't carry it in your pocket. So. Now, mine was a round one, and that's specifically why I went to the round. I actually ended up throwing it out. I had it sitting here on my desk for the longest time, and I always thought I'd fill it with fluid, and I'd come back two days later, and it'd be empty. And I thought uh -huh. it was maybe leaking out, so I filled it up and put it on there. And sure enough, it was leaking out, but it was because of the structural integrity. Uh, when they carved it out to put the ferro rod uh, into the side of it to strike, they went too deep. And so when I sh uh -huh. struck it, the ferro rod broke, and that fell out, and I seen the hole, and I was like, oh, okay, it's probably in the garbage bag still back there but um yeah but awesome design i loved the idea off it and when it worked like when you dipped it in struck it it worked awesome it's just a little bit of cotton twine uh kind of wrapped around the striker on the one i had same kind of idea with the one you got there yeah it's 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 there's a tube with the striker sticking in the middle and it's just a bit of cotton wick coming up on either side and anyway they work um like i said i, I do like them uh, I, I carry them sometimes as a backup, as an as as another option. I try to keep two or three methods of lighting fire 
in my pocket. I have the uh, the little like uh, striker. It's unfortunately in my pack, which I, I haven't got with me right now. But one like this, I assume that's what identical. we were talking about. Yeah, and I tried making them out of the end of files. This one has had good success, although the little piece of quartz I got here, it's it's finicky. Uh, I got a few good sparks out of it. But that's it today. Um, but I've tried all these methods. They're all good. Um, but these are all to just get a spark, you know, like in the end. Uh, a spark does not equate to a fire in the end. That is for sure. No. That's kind of what the idea of, uh, kind of the idea of this whole setup there is it, it's just literally what looks like, um, uh, some sort of fire rope in there. I've never actually used this. So I don't even know how well it works, but it, it's got some sort of fire rope in there, and it's literally, um, it, it looks like the, uh, where's my, it looks like the the flint side of a Bic lighter. You know what I mean? Like without the, the tube for any liquid or anything like that, and it's yeah. literally just a flint with a wheel on it, and it's supposed to catch spark onto this. One of these days I am going to try it. But, I mean, even that striker would work great for charcoal, which is something else we'll talk about in a little while. And there's something to think about. Um, even a little Bic lighter that's pretty well out of fuel will still throw a spark. I have seen them light the cotton balls with Vaseline on them, just the sparker with no fluid. Yeah. So, I yeah. mean, just be, like you said, just because it's out of fluid, it can still, if, as long as it's still throwing a spark, if I can get my words out here, I sound tongue-tied, as long as it's still throwing a spark, you can still potentially get some fire out of it. It's trickier, like, you, you're, you're literally trying to get, like, a little piece of char cloth, I mean, I think I know you have char cloth and all yeah, that, I got but, some in the back there, but that in there to try and get the spark, but it's, it's a chance, it's a chance for flame, so if you're in a in a tight situation, there's there's a lot of ways to get that. The other one, I think you're much more friction fire. It's something I haven't really succeeded at. Uh, friction fire is tricky. There's a lot of things that go into friction fire, and even and I may be lumping myself into a whole group I shouldn't be here, but even those of us that have more experience with friction fire, um. It's not always a guarantee. There's a lot of things that go into it, like the relative humidity in the air, the materials you're using, uh, your physical capability, because all friction fire takes a lot of effort. Uh, even things with fancy bearing blocks with bearings in them, no pun intended there, you're still using a lot of physical effort, especially if you have like an, uh, my old socket block there. I did a video on making, which is a rock, but I mean, if you take a stick and you grind into that, that's causing a lot of friction which now translates into more effort you have to put out to actually get that going fast enough. And that's the other side of that. Do you have all the materials to make a friction fire? It's not as easy as just, well, it can be as easy as rubbing two sticks together if you're good with a hand drill. But it's, uh, it's generally in Nova Scotia, especially where we have a wetter climate, it's not as easy as rubbing two sticks together. Does that make any kind of sense i've only successfully made a fire out of a hand drill twice and i bet you i have tried 400 times i mean i've gotten an ember a lot but the ember's a lot more delicate and it's harder to work with so i've never i've only actually gotten a full-on fire with a hand drill twice I've, I've watched a couple of guys do it a couple of guys are pretty slick like they were they were literally talking to me and they, they grabbed a couple of pieces of wood and they're just chatting to a group of us and they just it was it was almost fluid. Like it was really neat to watch. And I've watched other people try like same method, same type of materials, struggle and struggle, and then just give up like through exhaustion. Uh, so it's something that's you definitely want to practice and learn, and it's something that's high on my list to do. But oh heck, there's uh, no such thing as mastering friction fire. Something as simple as being off a couple degrees on the notch you cut, or just an wow. a splinter. That's at a place holding that ember from falling down into the notch can be enough to screw you up. Like it is just outrageous what can cause problems with friction fire. I've tried a fire plow and like you said, I have tired myself out out of absolute exhaustion. Like I just could not do any more and it was still ice cold or lukewarm at best. Let's go with that. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I, I see what you're saying. It's 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 an art. It's a skill. Uh, if you can do it, if you can master it, if you can, then it's one less item that you potentially have to take. But the effort it takes to make a bow drill, to set it all up, and then light the fire is infinitely more than the effort it takes to carry a ferro rod or a Bic lighter or one of these magnesium rods or all kinds of other methods. Well, that's and just again, the thing. All, all of these other methods, all alternative fire methods, are still not as easy and as guaranteed as a Bic lighter or even some waterproof yeah. matches. But even a light... Even with waterproof matches, if you screw them up, they're done. With a Bic lighter, you get hundreds of flicks out of one full lighter. You don't see the smokers out there with, with matches, generally. You don't see them with ferro rods trying to light the end of the cigarette with it. Like, and, you know, smoker wants his flame now. He wants to get a cigarette lit. And it's the quick, simple method. This is, These are the people who depend on it. I mean, you, you can always count on a smoker to have a lighter. You know what I mean? Oh, for sure. They're not out there rubbing two sticks together, like you said. It's just a lighter and go. And when that lighter dies, you will hear about it indefinitely (laughs) until they get a new lighter. That's how reliable a lighter is. And that's something to keep in mind when you're going out in the woods. It is nice to be able to use a bow drill. It is nice to be able to use a hand drill. It's nice to be able to use a ferro rod. But you're guaranteed with a Bic lighter, providing that it has fluid and you have the dexterity to actually flick it and hold the, uh, the button down. I mean, even if you got wet, wet starting material, you get birch bark that's been, you know, in the river or whatever. You can shake it off, hold the lighter on it for a few seconds. It's going to light. If, you know, you, you can you can dry small sticks and, and ignite them with a, with a lighter. The, uh, and I had a piece of it, but I used it to tie my lighting up. The fire rope from Canadian Tire with the little red red stuff in it, you can get a spark on that and get it to light, but it's a little tricky. Flick it with with a flame, it's lit right away, and then you got a, a longer lasting, like a mini candle. Or uh, almost a what do we got? Fuse. Actually, I have I have in my tinder bag of all things. So this is my. I might as well talk about this. This is the Tinder bag I carry in my backpack wherever I go. When Ben and I went out, I had this with me. Uh, I think I actually ended up using a little birch bark out of this to get our fire started because we didn't collect any on the way in. Um, so in this, anytime I find... What's that? And the stuff we were hoping to get was across the river. Yeah, yeah. I didn't get brave enough to cross that until the second day. But uh, anytime I find a down birch tree... It's habit for me, if the bark's flaking off and it looks like it'd be good for lighting a fire, just grab a handful of it and jam it in your pocket. Yeah, you'll get a little bit of sawdust and some crap in your pocket, but you know what? Once you get back, or you settle down, you make your camp, whatever, throw it in a bag and eventually you'll get a ton of it. Like, I got enough here I could probably make, I don't know, 20, 30 fires easy. Plus, I got a bag of cotton balls in the back here with uh, some expired hand warmers and you know where i'm going with that so something you can do with this if you're ever interested and want to try it is something called a rudica roll um i'm trying to remember the gentleman the very first nova scotia bushcraft gathering he showed me how to do this and that's actually where i got those supplies and i've been carrying them around and it actually works really well once you catch on to the i don't want to say trick but once you get the knack of it it's super easy. Uh, it's a real nice alternative method for people to start on because it's it doesn't take a whole lot. Uh, it's just some cotton swabs, especially the ones that you can unroll a little bit. And you can use uh, some iron oxide, which is just rust that comes out of that. That's basically what comes out of them when they're expired. You can use ashes out of your previous fire. Uh, and I've heard some people have even used like uh, old crushed up charcoal, stuff like that. Like anything that's really powdery that'll rub together apparently will work. And sand, just... I heard, does work. What does? Fine sand, I heard, will also work. I've heard that. I haven't seen that one done, so I can't confirm or deny if that works. But I have seen the, the iron oxide, and that would make sense for sand. Uh, I have seen the charcoal and I have seen the ashes, like just the pure powdered ashes. And you just roll that up into almost like a cigarette, like you're rolling it with your fingers, roll it nice and tight. And then you just keep rolling it tighter and tighter and tighter. 
and eventually you're going to end up with this little cigarette thing with the stuff in the middle and then you just put pressure to it and rub it with uh, two pieces of wood much like if it was rolling on here and then another piece and you just roll it and it, it only takes 20 seconds and it'll start smoking and uh it lasts a long time it's a really hot ember too it's an excellent way for anybody starting out that wants to try some primitive methods that's not for instance a ferro rod because uh ferro rods are pretty straightforward i watched that method at, well at the same time you did because it, it was the first bushcrafting weekend uh, I'm sure. And, uh, yeah, it was an amazing thing to watch. It was pretty quick and simple and easy. And, uh, and like you said, you can do it out of almost anything. Cotton, as long as you have loose fibrous cotton, some kind of friction material like the ones you mentioned. And two, he had, a was it two flat boards that he had grooves cut on one side? Yeah, because he was teaching, um, the set he brought, if I remember the story correctly, and hopefully I don't butcher this. He used to teach scouts or sparks or something like that. Yeah. And it, it was just a little bit of, uh, he, he notched it out so that it would grab it better because they didn't have the downward pressure to ensure that it would roll. So the grooves just actually uh, made sure that it would roll. Yeah. But yeah. yeah. And uh, he had a couple of handles on it, a bit like a hand plane. Yep. And it worked yeah. amazing. And that's actually where I got my first one to work was using his setup. And then I tried it and I was like, holy crap, this is great. And then I tried it a few more times at home and it it's relatively easy. Uh, Sean Hill listening to us was saying um, he can use this ferro rod with mittens on. Can't do that with a Bic. So that makes this ferro rod his go-to. And that's a good point. Um, now for me, I, I do carry a ferro rod. When I go into the woods, I always carry a ferro rod. I carry flint and steel, char cloth. I carry storm matches. I usually always have a storm lighter. And I take my bearing block, but unless I'm really, uh, unless it's good weather and I'm not relying on that fire to stay warm and potentially survive the night, then I might attempt a bow drill. Even though I am quote unquote good at it, uh, I never rely on it as my go-to fire method. I mean, during the summer I might, because I know worst case I might get a chill, I'm not going to freeze to death, but during the winter I would never... I would never rely on that. Um, so Adrian asks, ever made your own chair cloth? And the answer for both of us, I believe, is yes, because Ben just held some up there a little while ago, and mine's just right there. So that that's just the last little bit I got left over there. I was just telling Ben before we started, I am going to have to make a new batch. And for those that are wondering, seeing we're on the topic, what chair cloth is, it's basically any organic material uh, that you burn without the flame actually touching it. So the idea behind that is you would have a can, something like this, um, drill some holes in the side of it, as you can see there with mine coming through, and you would put your cloth in there. In, in my case, I used an old cotton t-shirt. Apparently jeans works really well. And just put your cover on, leaving those holes open, and set this on some coals, for instance, or a, a camp stove. Uh, ben, you mentioned you use the barbecue. Do you use like yeah, the burner on the side of the barbecue or actually inside the barbecue? Inside the barbecue, I got a Altoids tin with one hole cut in the top. I, I, I fill it loosely, just throw it in the barbecue and, and wait until it stops smoking. And that's um, exactly it. Once the smoke stops, close that air off and just remove it from the heat, set it aside and leave it for a good five minutes until it cools off. Uh, if you open it right up, you run that risk of what's called a backdraft or a flashover. The whole thing could just light up and now you just burnt up all your char cloth. It won't hurt you, but it'll scare the snot out of you and ruin your char cloth but once it cools down you'll open it and you'll come out with a material like what ben has there and what i got in the bag which is just charred cloth funny enough that's how the name came from it and that catches a spark super super easy uh if you have a bic lighter as we said without any fluid in it it'll catch a spark easy it's the go-to for flint and steel uh it works great with a ferro rod i mean i, I got a piece of flint here this is actual real flint and a striker, which was from Peter, uh, what's his last name, Ben? Peter LePage? LePage? Okay. And, I mean, see if I can do this up and not set my face on fire. Um, and you'll have to be my guide there, Ben. You just kind of lay it on your piece of yeah. flint. And just you're just trying to lightly 
scrape off very fine, fine shavings off your striker. And what's happening is you're shaving them off so fast that they actually produce heat. And Got it. Uh, yeah, see if I can do this before I burn my fingers. Can you see that one oh, up no. there, Ben? Oh. oh, yeah, you got it. Okay, it's burning my fingers. Um, so, yeah, and it, it just catches and holds a spark really well. And now that I have that on my can, you can see that will just sit there and it'll smolder a little bit and it'll hold heat and you put that in your bird's nest and you just blow some life into it. Now, I'm going to put it in the can and suffocate it. That way I don't set my office on fire. Um, set that over there. And yeah, that's, that's char cloth and it, it's great stuff to work with. And it's another thing that for anybody starting out that wants to try some alternative fire making methods, make yourself up a batch of char cloth. And even if you use it with a ferro rod, uh, you don't need flint per se. I have a piece of flint cause it does throw a little bit better sparks. You can get what's local around here is quartz. You can quartz. find that anywhere. Uh, a good place to find a big surplus of quartz is go somewhere where they just made a parking lot. Because usually they'll take this out of the quarry and when they're dynamiting it and stuff to blow the chunks to make smaller pieces to put underneath the asphalt, for whatever reason there tends to be a ton of quartz in that. So it must be far enough down that you hit the metamorphic rock sections and blah 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 blah, but that's a geologist question, less about bushcraft. Oh, and one it, of the most common minerals. And I mean it, I don't know if you can see the sparks, but... Oh, it will, uh, right. you might see one you or two do. come off there. There's not a lot of sharp edges on this, so you may have to take it and give it a smack with a hammer or something like that. But you do need a sharper edge, as I said, to try and shave off that, uh, there we go. They're all coming out towards my face, but you get the point. You need that sharp edge to try and shave off those metal slivers. Um, so I might be able to deal with this better. Yeah, there you go. There's tons coming out of bends there. And, on a, one of those magnesium blocks. Okay. And yeah, that brings us to the next one, which is like a ferrule rod. You can use char cloth with a ferrule rod, and ferrule rods are awesome because, as Sean said, <laughs> uh, Sean Hill, I'm better off beating myself to death with a bow drill. I won't suffer as long. <laughs> and that's, that's kind of the thing with a bow drill is it's – very discouraging if you try it for a long time and nothing happens. My two cents on bow drills, get somebody that can use one and knows at least a little bit about them to show you. Don't just try and go and do it on your own. I mean, you can. It's not going to hurt nothing. But if you want to get good at it or at least get better at it, get somebody that knows a little bit and has probably been showing a little bit about it to assist you in it. But uh, yeah, back to the ferrocium rods. They're, they're great because they come in so many different sizes. Like there's two different ones there. This one's a little bigger. This one's a little smaller. Ben's got a nice one Just there. The which is, uh, and they're not expensive. This is one of those, uh, I think this is a Wimpus. And it came with the ferro rod, a compass, which... Not very accurate a bit. You know what? More accurate than you think. It's pointing in the general direction of north. <laughs> it might be off a few degrees and it comes with a whistle striker i mean if you had nothing else for a compass yeah that's pretty close i'd at least try it it would give me a general cardinal direction but yeah they're not expensive i think i paid eight bucks for that and i mean it's yeah. it's fairly well used you might be able to see the the thinning on that, that was actually the first one I bought and started playing around when I was learning uh, alternative fire making. Uh, and they come in like tiny ones to like literally tiny ones. These are supposed to go on a drawstring for like a leather pouch or something like that. As you can see, they're drilled, but they're still ferro seam rods that will throw sparks. You can put up. Uh, no, sorry. These were bought because they're supposed to go on your shoelaces. There's some fun shoes, aren't they? Uh, they're, <laughs> they are a ton of fun. And in the bracelets, I don't have mine here. It's packed away, but, uh, just the paracord bracelets. I've even seen those. Like I said, I have one where this tong in the middle, it's a ferrocium yeah. rod. And then on the other side, it's a scraper and fair. You can, get those in can you, yeah. are they any good? 
I've, I, I've looked at it a ton of times. I've never really bothered. With the, such a short throw, you don't get a ton of spark. So, you know, in, in an emergency situation, I'd say it's it would potentially save your life. Would you want to depend on it for every fire for any length of time? Probably not. No, uh, it's definitely. And the trick with those ones, for the shorter ones, for what it's worth, and the same as, well, these are pretty thick. But I've had short ones like this that were thin, and I'm assuming those ones are going to be thin, is you got to brace it on something because as you're pushing in on it to try and get that spark, you can snap them yeah. off really quick. Uh, the other ooh. thing is, is, and I've seen a lot of people do this, is when you're getting that downer, a lot of people end up knocking whatever they're trying to put the sparks on off. So yes. have you tried, you sometimes pull, pull like hold the sharp edge still and just pull back? I do do that sometimes. I kind of, when it comes to strikers, let's touch on that because that's going to be kind of a segue into what I'm talking about. A lot of people use the backs of their knives and absolutely nothing wrong with that. The problem is your striker's pretty big and nine times out of ten, that's what leads to you knocking your material away is you can't see past your hand and you shoot too far. So what I like to make a striker out of is just a piece of hacksaw. And that's all that is. And it's only about the length of my finger. And I mean, that thing throws phenomenal sparks. Uh, like it's, I'm trying not to throw them at my computer monitor, but you can see that they're, it works great. And it's very similar to what this one is, except this one's a little thicker. So if I have a good striker, I'm more apt to put my ferro rod down on my material and firmly plant it down and strike down slower than a, a big flicking motion. It's just kind of a down, a little faster than that, and I stop short. I put one knuckle out further, and when that knuckle hits, I stop. And that's how I alleviate that problem. Now, if I am using my knife, and anybody that wants to use their knife, please be aware you need a good 90-degree angle in the back of your knife or it won't strike. If you're having a hard time and it seems to be slipping off a lot, just take a whetstone, uh, or a file or something like that and just put a nice 90 degree spine on your knife so it has a sharp edge to hit. Another thing that works great as a fire sparker or a striker, whatever you want to call it. You ever see these speedy sharps? Yes, I have a couple. They work excellent as fire strikers. I don't know if it ruins the speedy sharp or not, but it makes an excellent fire striker. But uh, well, that's a fire bike on it, right? Yeah, it's super hard. It's hard steel, so it shouldn't, shouldn't damage them. It, it should be, it's tougher than your knife. Fair enough. So there you go. It shouldn't hurt them in the slightest. Um, and yeah, if you have something like your knife and you're trying to see past it, and I don't actually have a knife here. I got this, but I don't really consider that a knife. But let's say that's your knife. And how did I lose a half inch fire steel? There we go. Um, Joe Robina? <laughs> So, actually, that has a pretty good spine on it. What Ben is saying is you would put this... I can't angle my camera down anymore, so... Um, if you had this down in your material, you'd take your knife and pull the striker yeah. away from it. Oh, it actually sparked. Um, and that will alleviate the... throwing of your Tinder bundle, if you will. Uh, or at least it'll help a little bit with it. But believe it or not, I find by doing that, I have more of a tendency to knock all my tinder around so you kind of got to get what's what works for you don't a lot of people go online they'll say see somebody say this is the best way to do it and it's the only way to do it. if you're not doing it this way you look like a noob or a beginner or a rookie or whatever take that mentality and throw it out the window all these people and just even ben and i are giving you ideas of how we do it if you build on that and formulate around that that's that's what it's all about do what works good for you. Um, I'm sorry if I butcher your name. Uh, Ke Keelan? K-E-E. -E, I think that's L-A-N. McCormick. So we're going to call you McCormick. Uh, ever use a tinderbox to start a fire? So the premise of a tinderbox is if you had an Altoids tin, for instance, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, and you put, just put charcoal or something in there, like from your old fire. If you take your charcoal, it's basically carbon based organic material, which is all you're doing when you're making char cloth, you're carbonating an organic material and you just strike down into the tinder box 
and that would light potentially your charcoal on fire and you would use that to start your fire like you should be able to blow that uh and get flames out of that yeah and I, it's very common for Altoids tins, and I wish I had more Altoids tins. I got one, I think. Uh, I seem to have lost all the ones I had. But, yeah, I have actually used it. Um, it's, you mean like, yeah. And, like, you would have some charcoal or something in there, and you just throw sparks into the tin, and that's your tinder box. So, basically, all you're doing is you're creating more surface area for your char cloth or your charred material. Yes, I have used it with success. Uh, I have since moved to the char cloth, only because it takes up a little less room and it's one less thing for me to carry. Uh, and I, I enjoy it. One of my favorite ways to light a fire is with char cloth and flint and steel. I don't know. It's real primitive. I just like it. Um, but there's nothing wrong with using a tinderbox. I mean, it, it works good. I know a lot of people will uh, burn a little bit of grass something like that, and get the, the charcoal off that or the charred remnants of the grass and use that in their tinderbox. And you can literally get a flame right out of the tinderbox. You don't have to blow it into a bird's nest. And it works really, really well. So it, it's another very valuable way of lighting a fire, but keep in mind that takes some preparation. You have to take uh, the actual charred material in your tinderbox in with you. No, not unlike charcoal. So as long as you prepare with it, I, I think it's a great method, but once again, uh, I am probably going to rely on my stormproof lighter first and foremost, if I am 100% relying on that fire, if I need to get warm, I'm not going to screw with any of this stuff. I am just going to make something with a fire or sorry, with a lighter or a match get warm. And then I can figure out what I want to go from, from there. Um, I mean, this is all great. I don't mean to cut you off. Too no, much. no, it's all good. How, how to get basically the spark and i think it might be a good time to move along because yeah regardless of how you start at your fire like what if you can't get it from that initial spark or that initial little ember to an actual full out fire you're wasting your time like you doesn't matter bow drill ferro rod lighter blow torch if that's your start that's your, that's what ignites your ignition but from there the whole act of building it up and, and going from and this is what a lot of people I, i've gone to uh campgrounds and seen people there usually I, I joke they're city dwellers but they're not always i've seen firemen doing it i've seen all kinds of people doing it. they have full logs and they got a little bit of paper they like the paper they stick it under the log and then they're sitting there saying, well why why was my fire going and it's because fire requires multiple steps to build up you need your small medium big type system right so you start with your tinder your fine materials then you go down to pieces that are basically the size of like leads if you can get it and just the more stages you have the more success you're going to have no 100 percent correct um kind of on your topic thing, there sciencey question for you ben let's see how you yeah. do does wood burn this is a trick question no. <laughs> that's right so no. wood doesn't burn no material truly burns per se it's the rapid oxidization off the material itself creating the vapors that burns safe yeah. to say that yeah the gas that it ignited that, that ignite so you need to get something hot enough that it releases a gas that will ignite exactly so on to what you said it's very hard to say get the back of this piece of wood to start oxidizing or vaporizing so that it will burn as to where if you had, uh, there it is, this it's piece of wood, a... yeah. it takes a lot less heat to make this vaporize to start oxidizing, so it'll burn. Yeah. So, I mean, it, we talked about this before, and, I mean, the other method we didn't mention, I, I, I had a, a magnifying glass, great way to, I actually picked up a dollar store from, um, but not uh, the big square ones. Have you seen those? Big square. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> sorry, I couldn't help myself. Do the big square ones work at, at all? I don't know. Oh, yeah. You could get the big ones out of, uh, you know, the big uh, floor models, big screen TVs before like the plasmas and the LEDs came out? Yeah, the projection style with the bulbs in the back. 
Yeah. Well, there's a giant, like, full full size of the screen magnifying glass in the back of one of those. If you can ever get one of those out, you can melt pennies. Seriously. Well, now I know oh, what yeah. I'm trying. It, the next, I, every now and then I see one, and I've, I haven't been able to stop and steal the TV, but, like, they're on the side of the road. Someone's just throwing them out. Take them apart. They're full of magnifying glasses. But uh, there's, there's some great videos. Guys, frame them out. Put them on a stand. There's ones that are 50 inches quarter to quarter or 60 inches. They're massive. You can uh, you can literally melt rocks. Um, well, now you know what I'm going to go try. I'm going to go buy a projection TV and pull the magnifying glass out of it. I'm going to be into this for $700. My wife is going to hate me. And all I'm going to do is sit out in the yard laughing oh, it makes, my guts out. No one makes those projection TVs right now. And, and nobody wants them. So people are throwing them out. You you put in wanted just a... a uh, on Kijiji, want old projecting TV for experiment or whatever? I'm sure someone will donate it to you. Or I was going to say, I remember lots of people having them, but now that I think about it, you're right. Nobody has those anymore. Yeah. But there's a whole bunch of little ones that are about this big around and about half an inch thick. They're amazing But the, for, for that. But I mean, I had this one at the dollar store, and like I said, I, I found ones that were like the size of a sheet of paper mm-hmm. at... Uh, one of the dollar stores. And I actually had that in my backpack. So slid that, down that's the it. ones I was talking about. Those plastic ones that are full sheet. Can you get a fire out of those? I often thought maybe they wouldn't be high enough magnification or where they're not perfectly straight. They might distort the light. Like I've never tried one. You got to play with it, but I'm sure you can. I, I That's why I have mine. The one I, I found in, I, I'm, I've tried with this one too. You Varying success. You kind of need a bright day if it's, Slightly overcast. And that's what's with this one, I find. Like, this is a fairly thick one, as you can see. It's high magnification, so it's a little easier. But it's still not that easy. But you, It's surface area one. Like, the bigger the surface area, and then getting it down to the smallest point. So if you're taking one square foot of, of sunlight and, and focusing it down to an eighth of an inch, that's taking a lot of heat and concentrating at one point. So you, that's where you get enough heat to ignite. Uh, we talked about this this method here before the bowl. Yes. Yes. So if if you get your tender tender and I accidentally started a fire tonight, um, we're playing with it. Um, but you take whatever you got your 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 uh, char cloth, drop in there. Take some small pieces of material, shavings with your knife or off of like the sawdust pile, little pieces of, of tinder. I have a little tinder bag with you. Uh, these instant fire things, you, you play with these? I have a bag, never tried them. Uh, I got something that's somewhat similar like those. It's it's the little fire pucks or insta fire or forever fire yeah, or something I, like that. The square yeah. ones, they were uh, that's a wax impregnated. Just some I sort think. of wax impregnated cotton wick or something you can make these out of sawdust uh and wax i'm sure you've seen these little wicks sticking out of it not like that uh, i haven't i love that idea oh no uh, i got a ton of this i uh, mel makes them out of egg cartons to start the fire here yeah the uh the makeup thing impregnated in wax i went a little overboard with the wax whatever um even these things, these tea lights, any, anything, whatever you've got that you, that's going to start a fire, you can put in the bottom of one of these bowls, and then you build your fire up within it. And this thing kind of focuses the heat. Like as it hits the outside, it kind of focuses the heat back in like a parabolic lens. Something like that really increases your chance um, and protects the environment, I guess. That's secondary, really. Well, you said one of your buddies takes a great big metal bowl with him, and that's all he exclusively builds his fires in. Yeah, yeah. Well, Quaint. No, nah, he's a buddy. I'll, I'll give him that. <laughs> he's probably with me. I need a favor from him someday. And, I mean, that's an awesome idea, especially if you're out when it's a little drier or something like that. Your fire can't spread as long as you keep it somewhat small. Like, that's a beautiful idea for making a fire. I've said that before, and I'll say it again. And honestly, it doesn't weigh much. Like it's a big thing. Like when you see it, like it's it's a big thing. But you can do your fires in it. You can 
wash in it if you need to. Like you can use it as a wash basin. Uh, if you had a fire outside, you can put water in it and just hold it over the fire for a few seconds. And you can warm up a fair bit of water in them really quick. They like said they don't weigh much. Once they go in your pack, you can pack stuff in it and around it. So it's it's definitely a method for containing your fire. But yeah, it's this the real skill to me beyond getting the fire started, which is is fun and games in the end. And that's is all it is. Build up. Because after this, everyone really needs to use the same four or five methods. I mean, I use one I call the log cabin where you stack them, so like a square up. Yep. Some people do the TP method. I'm more um, prone to the TP. Well, it's kind of a, I don't know what mine's called, rat's nest. <laughs> but I do have but, a method to it. Yeah. The end result is you start with the smallest materials and work your way up and keep adding on. And eventually you can lay full, full logs, round logs, and you'll still get fire because you've got enough initial heat to uh to get something going right and that's the key you have to have enough heat to ignite the material you want to burn so the bigger the material the more heat's required to burn it yeah. so with that in mind if you only have an ember starting that means you can't throw a log on it it's not going to do it you're going to need something fine you'll as ben said there you're going to need like shavings or you're going to need twigs or you're going to need something smaller than that and then once you get those going well now you can move up to something the size of your pinky finger you get those going maybe your thumb you get those going maybe your wrist and you just keep building up yeah um and I keep waving this around. This is actually a real good one to start your shavings out of. That that's fat wood. That's pure pine fat wood there. Oh, yeah. And I just threw it away. But anyway, um, it, it's excellent. If uh, nobody knows what fat wood is, that's a segment on its own. But basically, it's pine or any real tree. But pine is the big one here. That's just soaked in resin. Kinda has a turpentineish smell. Is what some people say, but. Honestly, I, I guess I smell something there, but maybe I just don't smell turpentine. Um, Oftentimes, wood near the root or right near where the uh, the branch comes out of a tree is usually really resin-packed, and that's what people try to get. You try to find a dead, dry tree where the resin's packed. Uh, if you wait too long, it kind of comes out of it. If you get it at the right time, you can pick it up. It'll, it'll seem denser. It'll almost seem oily. When you cut it, mm. it'll it almost kind of a wettishness to it um, and that stuff leaves it takes a spark easily it burns a long time and there's more of a that's the piece i processed down a little some of it but that was a, a real good piece it's almost reddish though it doesn't show it in the light that's uh, almost a ready material compared to the actual wood that was my demonstrations for another class anyway um yeah, and, and the key concept, and that's another failing I see with people when, um, let's say you used a bow drill or even char cloth or something like that, and you got your ember and you're trying to blow your bird's nest into a flame. Um, that That's a talent all on its own, too. Just don't think because you got a spark that you're going to ignite that bird's nest. There, There's a lot into that. I've seen people get a spark tons of times and never be able to get it to a flame. That's something you got to practice as well. It's kind of, you got to give it oxygen, but you can't give it too much oxygen. And then as it gets bigger, you have to give it more oxygen, but still not too much oxygen or not too little oxygen. And yeah. the only tip I can give for that is it's more by ear than by sight or smell or anything else. It's when I do it, it's all by sound. I can almost close my eyes and tell you how that's doing. And that's what works for me. And if you ever want to try it, just try doing it by ear. You can almost hear what the fire needs to to get going if that makes sense what about you ben have you ever tried to uh, blow a bird's nest into flame and any success with it yeah i have um for, for me it's I, I think too many people uh panic with it and, and push it too hard too fast it is a thing where if you have nice dry material if you've done it all pretty good they will the oftentimes flare up quite quickly and easily if not it's taking that bit of time and, and not trying to basically blow it out but just keep a steady flow to it and then it's okay to take a break for a second and let it just sit there and breathe but some people panic and uh, either basically blow it out or, or, or give up too easily yep. um, but I, I 
I tend to use more material and I try to prep fairly well. And sometimes when I'm just messing around, I'll, I'll see how little I could use to start a fire. Um, and that's a good trick. It's good, good practice, but you really, when you're going to make a fire with it, they say you should have two to three times what you expect to need. Yeah. Get what you, um, same rule yeah. of thumb for everything. It's get what you think you need and then mm-hmm. times it by three. Some people yeah. say four, but definitely by three. Yeah. Uh, and it, when you're walking through the woods. There's always dead, small dead branches hanging on trees and stuff. You just go picking those up as you walk through. You walk down. You don't have to walk through much much of a forest to, to end up with an, a good arm load of really tiny dry tinder. And that stuff that's sitting in the trees, the lower branches of spruce and, and pines and, and all these trees, they're usually pretty dead and dry and just hanging on there. Even if it's the ground is soaked, those things are usually bone dry. And uh, you, get, you get those going on, you build yourself a nice base of those. And if you get a small ember or flame going, you get in inside of there and let it go, and it'll go off. And the other thing that is shockingly uh, flammable is the, we call them blasty boughs, but the red evergreens that they have dried out to the point where they're red. Yep. You throw something like that on fire, it's, you might as well have thrown gas on it. Like, there's not much that burns hotter and faster than that. No, and that's that's a very good point. Uh, dried pine cones work really well, too. Like the big fluffy pine cones, those suckers will get a fire going and real quick because they're full of sap and resin and everything else. So you catch one dried right. out, not wet, they will catch a flame and they will run with it. Um, you ever see these, Ben? And I just kind of have them on my side here and I might as well bring them up. These are a match. They're called fire sticks. And it's a match head with the impregnated material underneath it. Okay, yeah, I, I, I have seen stuff like it. I've never really used them. Neither have I. I had it in my backpack for you and I to try, and I ended up using a ferro rod. <laughs> the, I do have a couple of things I wanted to throw out there. Sure. Uh, we, we talked a bit about this. This is the... Uh, uh, yes. Fire piston. Um, this one I, I've had very success with, but I made this one myself. I see there's one on Amazon now that's not too expensive, like 20 25 bucks. Yeah, but there's nothing like the satisfying effect of making your own tools and getting them to work. But, yeah, with this, I, I made mine out of a copper pipe, uh, three-eighths steel rod. I told you I put it in a drill press. I filed in two grooves for wash or for O-rings, cut out a divot, put some hardwood handles on it, and after four or five uses, I blew the bottom out of it. I just glued it back on before we started chatting. But uh, the theory behind this thing is, like you said, you take your nice dry uh, chair cloth, you put in that little divot, put it together, and you slam it down as hard and as fast as you can to compress that air, and it works on the same principle, really, as a as a diesel engine just through compression you get enough heat to ignite the fuel and uh i don't really have anything solid enough to hit it off of right here but you can slam that down hard enough and fast enough you can you can get a flame and a key, have you tried oh, sorry go ahead yeah no i was gonna say a key point about that is and correct me if i'm wrong i've never used one it takes a, a more pressure and speed than what you think don't be scared of it. I actually hit it pretty good. Yeah. And sometimes when you do it right, there's like a loud bang. No, I don't. So anybody that's listening, you can actually hear Ben is hitting that on the floor pretty hard and pretty fast. It's not just a gentle push in it's a it's literally a slam and depending yeah. on what it's made out of um that's going to vary in intensity I, i've seen acrylic ones probably not going to get away with hitting those as hard but something like ben's there it's all made of steel you can actually give that a pretty good pretty good thump 
And that's the whole idea is to try and, uh, ah, she popped off. She's leaking on you. Well, no, she won't leak. It's just the, the handle I built for it. Oh, I got but you. I, yeah, like I said, this one may need new O-rings and stuff too. And I think if I made it again, I'd make this one a bit longer. So I'd have a better, a longer stroke. I mean, that's what you're trying to do, get this high compression. Yeah. Can I give her one last shot? <laughs> Thinking about it. And that's that's the key thing that we've been talking about with all of this. Just because you have the tools doesn't necessarily mean that the success is there. You have to practice no. with it and learn from it before you ever try and take it out into the woods and rely on it. And even if you're taking it out on the woods to rely on it, you should have a backup method. Because uh, Ben said he blew the end out of that. Imagine getting in the woods. That's your only source of ignition. You could practice on it, be perfect with it. You know you can get it every time. You hit it, and boom, you blow the end out. So now what do you do? Yeah. Um, you've seen the steel wool one? With a battery? Yeah. Heard about it. Never actually seen it. What did you just hit it with? This is a uh, basically 12 volts off your car, your power supply. I have a power supply here. Oh, okay. So you... I was going to say, how are you getting that to spark? <laughs> Wait. You just need to short it out. And there, it is. there you go. You got. Can you can see it now. Yeah, I seen it there for a second. And I hear this is a real good one. Like, it gets hot. Hot, hot. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I'm getting little sparks quickly out of this. I can hear the sparks, actually. You're hearing the relays and the power supply cutting in it. Right oh, here. okay. But, uh... Yeah, okay. Um, you, you have to use real fine wool for that, too, don't you? Like, get the finest steel wool yeah. you can? This is a coarser one. Uh, and a finer one would work better. And actually, here's a here is a fine one. So I have a, but yeah, you just uh, spare half. Oh, oh, look at that go! So it's easy enough way. That's something like if you have a, if you're in there with your quad or whatever, and you have a power supply off of it, or you have your batteries in it, you can get it there. If you have a you might get it off of a, like a, a D cell battery, like out of your flashlight or something. I, I know most people I see hit them with these, like the nine volts. That yeah, seems to be I, a, a favorite I, go to. Yeah. I can't say I didn't have a nine volt. I do have a nine volt. I just didn't want to take it out of the machine. <laughs> but That's all good. Things like the one I seen that a lot of people probably wouldn't think about. I watched a guy one time light a fire with the spark plug off of the snowmobile. How'd that work? Well, we were in the woods. Lighters didn't work or whatever. So he he uh, he took the spark plug out of the engine, hooked it back to the, uh, the, the uh, plug wire, ground it out, and he had a little rag with a little bit of fuel in it. So he put it against the engine, had someone pull it over, and the spark lit the, lit the rag, and he took the rag and tossed it right into the fire. Well, it, what would be the fire? That's ingenious. And it, it's, a, it's a method using what we had, right? We had a machine there that, that makes a lot of spark. That's how it runs. So he just pulled it. And like I said, he dropped a little rag into the, into the fuel tank, got a little bit of fuel on the end, and dangerous as hell, really, but... I mean, it worked. It, it, it was a calculated risk with, there's other people there. Yeah. But uh, that's what we did. I mean, he managed to get a, a spark of it. I'm pretty sure the same thing would work with char cloth. I haven't tried it, but if you had a piece of char cloth and, and put it near that spark, when it was jumping through that piece of material, you'd probably get that little ember. You can get it out. There's lots of methods. There's another one, iodine, out of your kit. Uh, iodine and potassium pernagamate, which yeah. I am not condoning anybody does or supporting anything that happens. If you do, you can find in most of your local hardware stores in the pool aisle or better yet, a hydroponic store in, around the, 
what what do they use it for there the filters for uh, in and around the filters and you can get uh, potassium permanganate uh, you can buy it online in small quantities but technically the pure potassium permanganate and I'm I know I'm saying that with a lisp or a speech impediment cuz I can hear it but anyway uh, you can get the pure stuff in small amounts but it is rest a restricted substance so you're only going to get like a couple grams of it here and there. Now down in the States, you can buy like five pound bags of it. It's not restricted down there, but here in Canada, it's still on the restricted substance list for whatever reason. Yeah. And uh, if you mix that with, uh, you know what? Nope. We're not going to put that one in this. <laughs> I'll tell you after the show, but I'm not going to say that on, on this show. But uh no, I mean, it's, so there's tons of methods. There's a lot of stuff that you can do. And, I mean, I don't know. Do you consider fire an essential thing? For me, yes. I know some people don't consider fire an essential. For me, fire provides companionship if I'm there by myself. Uh, it's yeah. something to do, so it keeps me occupied and busy. It's how I sometimes purify water. I stay warm, cook cook or heat in my food uh to me it, it's an essential you know what i mean um i couldn't think of it not being an essential what about yourself we're the only animal that uses it there there are in existence still in the world people who have not discovered fire <laughs> I'm not doubting you. That's just weird. I mean, I it, couldn't think about not. I couldn't go camping without a fire. I don't think. I think I'd be bored out of my mind. Fire makes things infinitely easier. Don't don't get me wrong. I mean, you can heat up water. You can you can purify water. You can you can kill off bacteria and stuff. Uh, food that's cooked is is infinitely safer than food that isn't generally, especially meats and stuff like that. If there's any risk of, of bacteria or viruses on it, by cooking it, you've, you've de reduced those risks, killed off those problems. It's one of the fastest ways to heat things up. It provides light and protection. It keeps wild animals away. There's a ton of advantages to it. But the reality is you could survive an extremely long time without the use of fire. Even in, in the, some of the coldest nights in the winter, if you built a decent shelter that was small enough and you got your yourself in there, especially with someone else, if you had good, you know, good hides or whatever to, to, to help insulate it, your own body heat would eventually warm that space enough that you don't need anything else. So your, your body could produce that heat. In the summer months, it's not essential. So good clothing and shelter to me is higher than fire. Well, I'm thinking back to, oh, for sure. Uh, but I'm thinking back to our camping trip and we would have had to get pretty close and personal to survive that second night without a fire. Like yes. in the same sleeping bag, kind of close and personal. <laughs> but, but that's a reality. If you don't have fire, that, that's... In the morning we lit the fire and the fire was... was a great joy to have the next morning. Like, don't, don't doubt me. And I think, I think I said it to me, that was about the limit of what the gear I took really could handle. I mean, the second night I ended up pulling a blanket inside the sleeping system with me. I, I threw some of my clothing over the top to give me that little bit extra insulation. I think the under quilt was doing its job, but the top quilt that are the top, sleeping bag that I took wasn't quite doing it. It was a summer sleeping bag mm -hmm. and this was a shoulder season weather. And you were in the same boat, I believe. We I had, had a an sleeping even bag. thinner sleeping bag than you. I brought an ultralight thin bag. And I was past yeah. the limit of what my gear would take. Almost I guess because I actually had to put my coat, my full clothes, two pair of socks, like I had to fully dress and pull my wool blanket inside with me to to sleep at all that night otherwise i just would have been beside the fire and i had thermal underwears on like i had a whole like full thermal shirt thermal you know right down to the ankle type thing which is more than i normally would carry um and i was chilly i was at the point of it was more surviving than enjoying um yeah that was a cold second night man <laughs> 
I mean, I, I'm sure someone's looking at us calling us wusses, but the reality is we've grown used to being kind of warm and... and I'm we, old we, and fat, we, but I like to be warm and comfy. That's all there yeah. is to it. I mean, I... I and, and there's an advantage. <laughs> you you had more body fat to help keep you warm. I've, I've noticed with, with the lower body fat that I do get colder much easier. Well, that's just it. Uh, it's, it's insulation. That's just what it is. And yeah, that's what I'm going to keep uh, telling people. I can survive the winter better. <laughs> you can. You, you most certainly can. And... If you watch any of the survival shows, right away, if me and you went for to, to challenge each other for an extended period in the woods, you have an, an, inertial, or an initial advantage that you have more time before you're at the point of starvation. Yes. Of, of really no energy. We both need to pull in uh, minerals, uh, different vitamins and stuff to stay healthy, but that's a little easier to get and it's it's going to be about the same but the fats and carbs that's what's going to be hard to get proteins to some degree i guess yeah but once again that would be easier for to acquire with a fire would you not say because if you caught something say an animal or a fish or something like that it would be i guess you could eat it raw i i would say you couldn't but uh, fish you can easily dry. Uh, actually, most meats you can dry. Um, so in the sun, hot raw, cut it thin, it'll dry up, similar to jerky. Uh, can be done without fire. Uh, there are means and methods uh, to doing it. I'm not saying they're better or superior by any means. I'm just saying the methods exist. Uh, so I, I don't put fire as essential, but I think it's it's probably the highest creature comfort we have oh it definitely is it's a great thing and like, when you get in there and you've got your fire like you say at night psychologically it's it's a comfort it's it, it makes you feel happier safer it's it's enjoyable to almost no end really well that's just and it. If with- you go in the woods by yourself a fire is companionship. It's something just to stare into. You know what I yeah. mean? Well, I was camping with a couple of guys earlier this summer, and they were talking about winter camping. And one of the guys said he bought one of these uh, heat buddies or whatever, the little kerosene uh, heater yep. for his hot tent. And he said, you know, and for a lot of things, it was great. It put out a lot of heat. Uh, and and wasn't all that much effort to pull into the woods for the trip he did, but he was bored. He literally missed the stove. Like he wants a stove now. I think he's working on building it. And the reason was, and I'm pretty sure it was Gary Lynch, but maybe I'm misremembering our conversation. But the the thing he said is, when you got a little wood stove or a little fire, you have something to do. You process the wood. You're cutting up the wood. You're putting it. You're feeding the fire. It's it's something to do. Yeah. And that, and that activity, that, that working, that makes everything so much better. Because if you're sitting there with nothing to do, then you get bored, and then your mind starts going. And I don't care how tough you are or how, how much of a superman you are. I mean, you, you could be nearly as tough as me. And you're going to eventually start thinking about things and saying, what was that noise? And that fire is going to save you that trouble. You know what I mean? Like, it's... On that note, think about the noises we were hearing coming from the river. Imagine being there oh. with nothing else to do other than just sit and listen to those noises. Because at Somebody, times, oh, sorry, go ahead. Okay, we heard the rocks move, and it was like voices. We we could have swore we heard people talking. Well, that's that's what I was just about to say. At times, I was asking you, like, do you hear voices? Is there people like around? Like, do you? And I was looking around. And I'm just like, not really scared of it. Just kind of, well, what is that? But if you're away in there at night and it's dark. And you keep hearing this stuff, you're going to eventually freak yourself out. Fire gives you that little bit of companionship and safety. Yeah. So I'm not taking away from it and saying that, you know, it's it's useless and nobody needs it. But I am saying that it's – it. I wouldn't place it as at the essential level. But the comfort it gives is 
almost as important or more important than the heat that it really like for for the cooking and your own body warmth. It's the psychological aspect of it is is pretty well as important as anything else it gives you. I agree, hundred percent. And that's like I said, essential maybe not, but. For me, I would almost say I I would almost need a fire going into the... To enjoy it, I would need it. If I was in a survival situation and I couldn't, I'm sure I would make do, but it's... I, I can't picture going into the woods and not having a fire. So I would... Personally, I would almost make it an essential. Not that I'm arguing with you in any way, shape, or form. That's my personal preference. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, and I... And I, I... I stated that knowing full well that it would be a fairly controversial statement, but every other animal on the face of the earth, and, and make no mistake, I consider us animals. Oh, for sure. Uh, manages to live without fire, and I think we are every bit as capable as almost any other animal. I mean, there's animals with adaptations for extreme weather. I mean, a seal can live in much colder weather than us. Um Certain animals have like an antifreeze in their blood that prevents them from freezing at, at zero degrees. We, we don't quite have that. And as, as a result, we generally tend to, if you find people that live further north, we steal the, you know, the jack, the skins off other animals for heat and stuff. Right? But we're, we're adaptable. But the fact is, fire is much more of a comfort than in a sense, an essential thing to survive. In my opinion, I can agree to that. But do I enjoy fire? Oh, to no end. I think we're all <laughs> pyromaniacs. <right? laughs> if you don't like setting fires, there's something wrong with you. <laughs> Terrible thing I to say. We're all pyromaniacs. Right? Uh, but yeah, no, I completely agree. As um, well, now uh, a necessity. Probably not, like you said, on a primal level, but how many of us would continue surviving without a fire at this point in our lives, in this point of our development? How many of us would continue to survive without internet at this point in our lives? Fair enough. Fair enough. The, that the, is a, a good analogy. The meme, that's, the meme that's been going around lately is people... T- Talk to the cabin. Could you live six months in this cab without power and, and internet, uh, given all the stuff that you need to survive? And I still think I could. I think if you gave me, if I had some books and, a, you know, a few, few basic tools like, you know, axe, saw, knife, things that I could be making stuff with, I think I could gladly give it up for a while. Having experienced, uh, living isolated from, from the news for a period of time. Uh, and I'm thinking of when I was going through Bush, uh, uh, Bush uh, boot camp with the military. Mm-hmm. Um, and we didn't hear anything. I do know you will crave it. You will crave to know something what's going on with the world. Feeling isolated is a, is a real issue, but it's not life threatening. It's not going to stop you. And at some point, I think you might even not care what the rest of the world is saying and doing. That's um, fair. But three days without power, and a lot of people are literally losing it. And, you know, you showed up with a generator. Some of those people would pay everything they have for that power. <laughs> we ran our generator, not going to lie. We kept our freezers and stuff going, but we lost internet for, I think, a day and a half. And I didn't mind it that much. Well, we had- I miss my memes. <laughs> We we had uh, no power for, for about 20 hours, uh, and that wasn't so hard, but it was kind of shocking at one point. We got up uh, Sunday morning, and there was no cell phone service. Yeah, that's what we lost. We could make phone calls, like, but no data, nothing. Oh, I lost everything. I couldn't text Missy. I don't think I could call. I mean, we were in the same room, and uh, but I, I was surfing a net when i woke up it was working fine and then uh then it went away and so then we went and started the radio just to hear something mm. um but mainly 
I was wondering why. Why did we lose cell phone service? We didn't during WAN, but we did for this. I had the same kind of question. Well, I was the other side. Why did we have cell phone service with no data? It was just bizarre. And it wasn't just us, like here in the house. Uh, we asked some other people, and it was the same thing. They just they could get on their phones. They could make phone calls, send basic text messages. Nothing else. I couldn't even send couldn't even send a text there. I had no service, no bars. Hmm. Must have been some towers damaged, but we're kind of slipping off topic here, so it might be a good t time for us to wrap this up. It's coming on 10 o'clock. Yeah, I think we can wrap it up. Um, what we'll probably do in, in a future episode is actually light a fire. I was just sitting here thinking what we got to do with this topic is we got to get together and get outside. And yeah. we'll discuss some things and we'll do some demos. And yes, I will bring the bow drill and I'll bring the hand drill and we'll see what happens. Uh, I know yeah. what's going to happen. I'm going to get tired and curse a lot and hand blisters, but we'll try it. <laughs> we'll have a challenge. I'll, I'll try for the first time and you can try for the 212th time and see which one gets the fire first. I'll put my money on you every time. <laughs> <laughs> I'll break. Yeah, we can have some fun with it. We gotta. We'll chat a little bit after this. We gotta meet up sometime okay. anyway, and we do have a project on the go. But uh, maybe we'll talk about that next week. Drag some people back. A small piece of my hand. Oh, okay. Well, you just heard it roll away there, but we do have a project on the go. Just to give you guys a little snippet, a little taste, to leave you hungry. Uh, we are working on a project right now. Ben is working on the project. We have talked about it. Uh, and that project's going to evolve and hopefully it'll lead to another project for later in the coming season. Safe to say all that yeah. without letting too much out. Yes. And I, and I have an idea. And if you look behind me, you may be able to figure it out, um, for something for us to use. So I was uh, going to ask about that, but <laughs> anyway, uh, yeah, so y'all will come back. We'll talk about that. Maybe that'll be next week's episode as we'll talk about our project a little bit and some things revolving around that. And hopefully you guys will come back and chat to us and give us your opinions. And hopefully I left you with just enough of a tingling that it will make you come back. Hopefully. And we'll if, if not, if we get all our projects done, we're going to test them. So definitely want to tune in to see if we survive. Yeah, because uh, if our first outing has any indication... Um, we did survive, but maybe we weren't as prepared as we should have been. So maybe we'll, uh, step our game up a little bit next time around. Yeah. But all right. Have fun. Start practicing fire making. Uh, show us how it's done correctly. And, uh, we'd, we'd appreciate that. We may need this. Yeah. Like, like I said, just because I have a little bit more experience with some of the primitive fire methods or alternate fire methods... I'm not an expert. I'm not a master. I don't even pretend to be. I will show you what I attempt to do, and that's it. But yeah, so that's it for me. I hope everybody enjoyed themselves. Like Ben said, get out there, try things, but be safe. And as always, we're just here to try and give you guys our opinions and experiences. Uh, we hope you all take the time to practice before you rely. For sure. For sure. Get out there, practice, test your, test your stuff. Have a good night, everybody. And, safe. and as Ben said, be safe. I'm going to get that tattooed somewhere. Ben says be safe. <laughs> good way to end the show. I don't know why I said tattooed somewhere, but... <laughs>